You are watching a recording of a training webinar about how to conduct a systematic review. This webinar series was developed by the Impact Research Programme in partnership with Cochrane Common Mental Disorders and Cochrane Global Mental Health. So welcome everybody and thanks for joining session seven. Um, the topic today is quality assessment and risk of bias. Um, we'll start with our usual little welcome. We'll go through the homework from last time and then we will go straight into the topic for today which is about quality assessment in the context of a systematic review and why it is so important. We will speak a little bit about bias, again, in the context of a systematic review. I will tell you a little bit about the practicalities about of um, doing a risk of bias or quality assessment. And then we will finish by discussing the homework and there will definitely be time for questions at the end today as well. So today I'm supported by Nashma and Alexander. Okay, so a quick recap from last time. Session six was um, about data extraction, um, or the homework rather was about data extraction. And the task you had was to think about how you would extract data for the room air or oxygen review that um, addressed techniques to resuscitate preterm babies. And we had shared with you the Prospero registration for this. Um, and the question we gave you to think about was um, how you would go about setting up a data extraction form for the primary outcomes. The primary outcomes were death prior to hospital discharge and neurodevelopmental disability that was then broken down broadly into three categories um, at age one year, classifications of disability, so a diagnosis of a disability or sort of school outcomes at, at five years old or including IQ. Um, so please use the chat now to share your thoughts on this task and I would like you to think about in particular what types of outcomes these two outcomes are. Are they, are they dichotomous or are they continuous? We can go back over those terms in a minute as well if somebody, if, if, if you'd like a refresher. And the other question then is sort of related obviously to the first one is what kind of data would you be extracting for these out uh, for these outcomes and what kind of data would you expect to find in the papers that you're working with yeah i suppose you know death is definitely a dichotomous outcome it's it's two categories either dead or alive and yes iq would be a continuous outcome that's usually measured on a on you know an iq test scale but sim the same goes for, I think the, the outcomes assessed at, at 12 months, you know, those sort of um, developmental scales, they would be um, continuous outcomes as well. Classifications of disability, again, you're right, are um, dichotomous outcomes um, because either you have the diagnosis or you don't. The thing with continuous data is um, that quite often authors or trialists decide to make them cut into categories. So, you know, it could be a cutoff point on a scale, for example. So, you know, it could be a, any, any child with an IQ below a, certain, um, below a certain value would then be um, classified as, as having an um, educational delay, for example. So sometimes that happens. Um, so yes, there's some comments coming in now um, about the type of data. So for death, say we're focusing on death initially or, or one of the dichotomous outcomes, how would you extract that data? What, what is the information that you need to get out of the paper? For a dichotomous outcome, we're basically counting events. So for each of the two groups um, in, in a trial, we want to know how many people had the outcome or had the event and how many people didn't. So we would be looking at um, that n over n, so small n, meaning how many events in each group out of how many people in total in the group. Um, so we would be looking to extract data, for example, in the, in the room air group, maybe two out of 25 babies died 
and in the oxygen group maybe three out of 27 babies died. So I'm making up these numbers just to illustrate this here. So that's the kind of um, data that you would extract for a dichotomous outcome. And then if you have a continuous outcome, what's the data you're extracting? They are thinking about that you're, you're looking at the primary study. So you're looking at the trial publication. This isn't about what we report in our meta-analysis. The question at this point is what data are you taking out of each paper? Yeah, means and then some kind of a measure of how the how the scores were distributed around that mean. So that could be confidence intervals or it's often also reported as a standard deviation or a standard error in, in primary studies. If the mean isn't reported, sometimes um, you get a median, which is just sort of the middle score. It's, it's a slightly, it's, it's still an, a, an average measure, but it's calculated or, or worked out in a different way. And then medians are often reported with the range. So whether the lowest and the highest value is reported to give an indication of um, the spread of the scores. The preferred way of, of reporting continuous outcomes is means and standard deviations. So that's sort of the, the, the default that we're hoping to find in um, reports of randomized control trials, certainly. I think this, this point's really important, so perhaps reiterate it because some of the responses in the chat sort of mm -hmm. talking about odds ratios and relative risks. And yes, that's something that we would estimate at the end of the meta-analysis which we'll talk about in a future session but here when we're extracting data what we're trying to get is the primary data from each individual trial so we want their figures for things like the number with a condition or the mean uh, of that scale whatever that was measured rather than the relative risk at this point or the odds ratio because what we are interested in in it, at the end for our uh, meta-analysis is the relative risk when you when you combine all the data from the individual studies that are included in the meta-analysis and the review. So we are we are calculating a new risk ratio or relative risk or odds ratio or you know some sort of summary estimate um, as part of our meta-analysis. We are not taking that data from the primary studies the next sort of building block of our systematic review. So you can see it, they are highlighted in orange. Today we're talking about quality assessment and risk of bias. In practice, quality assessment and data extraction, so those two blocks next to each other in the middle there, are often carried out together. It's part of the same sort of um, task where you're looking through your um, published full text or whatever other material you're using and you're extracting information from those publications. If you're doing the two things in one go, then you obviously only have to look at each paper once in detail rather than having to go through it to extract the data and then go through it again for quality assessment. However, conceptually they are separate, which is why we've listed them as separate um, building blocks in the arrow here and which is why they have separate sessions in, in these webinars. Um, we are moving towards the end though, so you can see all of this happens long before we write up and all of these are things that you need to consider um, as you are writing a protocol as well. So you need to speak about how you're going to quality assess and how you're going to risk, uh, assess risk of, risk of bias, what tools you're using, who will be involved in it. All of this needs to be covered in your protocol and then you will go through each of these steps as you conduct the review following um, your protocol registration or publication. I'm hoping at the end of today, you will have an understanding of what quality assessment means in the context of a systematic review. I hope you will gain an awareness of why it is important and how study quality can impact your review results. 
And um, we will also spend some time talking about key sources of bias in randomized controlled trials. So hopefully your understanding of that will improve as well. And then there will be one slide at the end with lots and lots of links for you to check out in your spare time. Um, so hopefully you will know where to access some key resources for further learning and to consolidate what you've heard here today. So what is quality assessment and why is it important? Um, quality assessment is also known as quality appraisal, critical appraisal, risk of bias assessment. These terms are usually used sort of interchangeably and as if they mean the same thing. Some people argue the finer semantics of this. For today, I'm happy for us to use any of those terms. And the way I'm understanding them for the purpose of the session today is that they relate to the methodological quality or the method methodological rigor of the trials included in a systematic review. Randomized controlled trials, RCTs, are generally considered to be the most robust study design when your goal is to assess the effectiveness of an intervention. But even though they are considered to be the most robust study design and they are the most robust study design on paper in real life, they are open to errors and biases, methodological weaknesses, flaws, whatever you want to call them. So even the controlled environment of a randomized controlled trial is obviously happening in the real world. They're happening with people. Um, you know, people are involved at every step of the way. They happen in hospitals. They happen during uncertain, you know, there's always uncertainty. So even though on paper, the perfect RCT might be free of biases, we don't usually deal with perfect when, when it comes to um, research in the real world. And just to remind ourselves, I would like you to just use the chat now in a real sort of quick fire kind of way to just drop in some of the key characteristics of an RCT. What's the first thing, the most important thing for each of you when, when you think about randomized controlled trials? Just quick, you know, one, two, three word answers, um, and then we'll hopefully get come together. Um, and yes, lots of randomization there. Yeah, excellent. We often have blinding. We definitely need a control group. Indeed, yeah, so we have two groups that people are randomly allocated to. Um, outcomes are important, yes, of course. Yeah, they could be parallel or crossover. Confounders are accounted for, yeah, that usually happens through, um, through, through the randomization. Masking, yeah, different term for blinding. They can be double or single blinded, that's something that we'll pick up later as well. Explicit predefined analysis plan and outcomes. Yes, fantastic point there. And of trials now need to be registered. So this is usually in the public domain as well. Allocation concealment, another really important point that we'll cover. Um, matching of both groups. Yeah, the idea is that by randomizing your allocation to the groups, any differences between them sort of balance each other out almost. Um, the level of evidence is high. Yeah, that's that's sort of the point I was making on the slide there as well. That's right. Um, that they're generally considered the very high level of, of evidence that is produced by randomized controlled trials. Thank you, guys. That was really good and really helpful because I think now that we have those key points in the back of our heads, just as a refresher, what I'm talking about in the next couple of slides will you know, hopefully make a lot more sense um, and just be um, really easy to wrap your head around. So um, we've just, all these things that you guys have just mentioned in the chat are obviously, um, they can go wrong basically for want of a better word at this point. So these errors or flaws or weaknesses in the design of a trial, sometimes people, you know, for whatever reason, um, either due to unethical research practices or through conflict of interest or following undue influence of the, on the trial conduct by a conflicted party. So for example, a funder um, or, or somebody else with an agenda might deliberately change the design of a trial. That would cause bias. Um, and it would also 
weaken the evidence then as a result that comes out of that um, trial. Some, quite often, the flaws or weaknesses in trial design or in the trial conduct can be accidental, human error, sometimes things go wrong. Um, it could be due to lack of knowledge when trials are designed. That's often the case in smaller trials or when you've got relatively inexperienced trialists. They might not be aware of all the ways that bias could be introduced. And sometimes it's simply down to clinicians, for example, acting in the best interest of their patient. So I, I really... Um, uh, I pre you know, things like if, if a patient comes into your clinic and, and you know that they're going to be randomized now, um, it might be a case of you knowing that um, this is a very sick patient and you want to make sure they end up in the intervention group, not in the placebo group. Or you might think, I don't believe in treatment A, so I will make sure that all the very sick patients get put into group B you're not doing this on purpose to weaken the trial. Um, so you're not doing this deliberately to change the results of the study, but they do have the, these actions do have the potential to influence the results. And sometimes weaknesses, so-called weaknesses in the trial design are unavoidable. For example, blinding isn't always possible. If you're thinking about psychological therapies, for example, um, say in a trial where you're comparing um, co um, cognitive behavioral therapy with antidepressants, people are quite likely to know which um, group they're in and the same will go for the um, personnel delivering the intervention. And sometimes you can't randomize, for example, in emergency medicine trials, you know, I think we're all fully aware that in, in in an emergency room setting, it wouldn't be ethical to start messing around with consent forms and randomizing um, patients when they just basically need life-saving treatment right away. So even though these things are unavoidable or due to um, accidental errors, it doesn't really matter what causes the errors or flaws. They can all um, bias the results in favor of one intervention over the other intervention or interventions. And that's the problem. Um, it becomes even more problematic if the biased data from trials is synthesized, so put together in a systematic review. This is a concept that's sometimes referred to as garbage in, garbage out. Um, and I'm, I have a feeling that this might come back to us in the sessions about meta-analysis. Um, if you're putting biased data into a meta-analysis, the results of that meta-analysis will be biased as well. Um, and obviously that is problematic if we produce biased reviews because we all know how important systematic reviews are for evidence-based healthcare, evidence-based social care, or any other kind of evidence-based practice. So we need to be aware of the risk of these biases, because even though at the point of conducting a systematic review, we can't do anything about the bias in the trials, but we need to know about them so that we can share it with our readers. I'm just going to pause here just for a minute or two in case there are any questions at this stage. If we detect any serious bias in a study, do we exclude that from the systematic review? Ooh, interesting question. So I would say you do not, like in the systematic review part, you do not want to exclude any studies. Uh, so even if you think it's like very flawed, you want to be able to report that. Um, the inclusion later in the meta-analysis, um, that is more up to debate. Um, uh, I don't think there's like hard rules, but generally we want to include them all and only later in subgroup or sensitivity analysis, we will kind of like exclude or do subgroups by their uh, bias. Totally agree with that um, because your inclusion exclusion criteria are not around the quality of the study, just the fact that it is a randomized controlled trial and you know the, the other inclusion exclusion criteria we discussed before. Um, there is something that we do with the uh, 
quality assessment, the risk of bias assessment, uh, in terms of, uh, we'll, we'll probably discuss that when we get onto the meta-analysis, uh, what you can do to incorporate your quality assessments into your final meta-analysis but it's not uh, excluding them. And as Alexander says, there is also um, a, a possibility of looking at it in a sensitivity analysis to see what happens if to the results, if you, ex if you look at them without um, the low quality trials um, separately. Great, thank you both. That was a really comprehensive answer there. And um, to be honest, it did mirror mostly what I was going to say as well. So. That brings us to risk of bias. Risk of bias, ROB, is one important concept to consider when you're assessing trial quality and the quality of the evidence produced by a trial or several trials. Other um, sort of indicators of quality um, can be things like, has a, has a power calculation been done? How big is the sample size? Um, how um, how well does the population in the how do how well do the participants in the trial match the population that they were recruited from and all those sort of other considerations that are part of the quality assessment of a trial but they're not necessarily part of the risk of bias assessment. Um, risk of bias assessment in a sort of standardized form that we are using today is sort of a development that has happened in the last couple, uh, in the last decade, really, in the last 10 years or so. And Cochrane has been a main driver of that um, effort. So people were, people conducting systematic reviews and meta-analysis were obviously thinking about these things before then, but the reporting and the drive for transparency and reprodu reproducibility obviously brought on these standardized way of collecting the data. Um, Risk, uh, Cochrane has risk of bias tools for different study types, including observational studies and diagnostic test accuracies, accuracy studies. But today, as with the rest of the webinars we've, we've done so far and that are coming up in the future, we will focus on randomized control trials. A couple of points about the um, risk of bias tool, the Cochrane risk of bias tool. So version one has been in use for the past 10 years. Risk of bias 2, ROB 2.0 was released earlier this year. So clearly ROB 2.0 is, is the more current tool. And if you were to embark on a new Cochrane review now, that is what the expectation would be that you use. However, it is a very detailed tool and it's quite time consuming. So in the interest of giving you an introduction to risk of bias assessment, I am focusing on version one at this point, which is still you know, commonly used. It's still in circulation. And I have a feeling that people publishing systematic reviews and meta-analysis outside of Cochrane will probably continue to favor the briefer version one over the more detailed um, 2.0. So in this tool, I don't know how many of you have come across it, um, but just a quick sort of overview, there are six domains of potential bias. And as a review author, you assess the risk of bias for the trial of interest for each of these domains. So you're making a value judgment whether or not the risk of bias is high, low or unclear for each of the domains. The unclear category is a blessing and a curse because sometimes study reporting is um, incomplete or you're just really not entirely sure what went on in this trial. So having that option to say unclear can be really very helpful. But in terms of interpreting and getting a view, an overview of how good the trials are that you're including in your meta-analysis, unclear is obviously not a very helpful category because you end, if you end up with lots of unclear ratings, then you really, you know, don't know. Um, what, what the quality of the evidence is at all. So let's take a closer look at these domains in the risk of bias tool then. They map very nicely on those key part, onto those key characteristics of RCTs that you um, 
put in the chat box earlier. So that, that worked out really nicely. So there is selection bias, performance bias, detection bias, attrition bias, reporting bias, and a very helpful catch-all category, other bias. Um, selection bias encompasses random sequence generation and allocation concealment, two of the things that you mentioned. Performance bias and detection bias both are about blinding. So one is about blinding of participants and personnel, and the other is about blinding of outcome assessment. Attrition bias addresses the issue of incomplete outcome data, and reporting bias deals with selective reporting. Other bias is, like I said, the catch-all kind of anything else that might have biased the trial in any kind of way. We will go through each um, domain now um, in the next couple of minutes. I'm not going to spend excruciating amounts of time on this going into detail because this is meant to be an introductory session and um, on the further reading slide you will have lots and lots of information to get into if you want to know more about you know, some of the theoretic theoretical background to this. So starting with selection bias. So this is about how um, participants were entered into this trial of interest, interest. So the first component here is random sequence generation. The question here is, is the trial truly randomized? Um, and usually nowadays this is done through computer, generation, computer generated randomization sequences. Um, Again, I'm not going to go into detail here, but generally speaking, if you can see that kind of phrasing in a trial, you can work on the assumption that it was probably okay. Back in the day, um, um, random numbers list and that kind of thing were used as well before, you know, sort of randomization was more automated. But one thing to keep in mind is that things like randomizing by date of birth or day of birth as in weekday or day or date of admission to the hospital or alternating patients are not examples of true randomization. Sometimes we call these trials quasi-randomized, but really they're not randomized because if you're alternating patients, um, it's very easy obviously to know which um, group the next patient you're seeing is going to go into. And there might also be something that makes these groups different. Um, for example, if, if you're um, alternating by odd or even days of the week, if different staff members are in the hospital on those days and that's the same all the way through the month, then you might end up with two very different groups because, you know, one, one of the surgeons that's on call on all of the, or that's working on all of the odd days might do something very different to um, the staff that are working on the even days of the month. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, quite often quasi-randomized trials are included and then they are, um, the, the bias introduced by the, um, not by the randomization not being true is then addressed in the meta-analysis like Alexander was just alluding to. Um, random sequence generation is very closely linked to allocation concealment. So allocation concealment addresses the question if the person who is enrolling the patient into the trial knows or can they guess which group the patient will be allocated to. So for example, if your um, randomization sequence is alternating, then you will know I've just randomized Betty to group A. That means Judy, who's just come in through my door, is going to have to be in group B. I don't want Judy to be in group B, so I'm going to tell her to go back outside and wait until I've seen somebody else. So, you know, that's obviously not random and it's not concealed. Um, if you have got a big trial where, for example, they had the support of a hospital pharmacy or of a trials unit, quite often randomization is done remotely. So the person who randomizes or who sees the potential participant picks up the phone, rings the trials unit, says, I would like to randomize a participant to our trial. Um, somebody in the trials unit you know, does what they do checks the website, checks the randomization sequence and says, all right, that patient goes into group A or group B or whatever group it is. And um, that could also work through a website. And 
one of the sort of old standard phrases of, of how we how this used to be um, assessed as appropriate was sequentially numbered sealed opaque envelopes. So the idea there is that you have a stack of envelopes and you always take the first one, that's why they need to be sequentially numbered. You can't look through them by holding them up to the light to see what it might, what it might say on the card inside and they're sealed so you can't tamper with them. Obviously that is very pedestrian and old fashioned now but that's sort of the idea. The idea is that you don't know which group the patient goes into when they walk through your door. Once the participants are in the trial, um, you have this issue of performance bias. So this is to do with blinding of participants and personnel. And in this case, participants includes everybody um, that has anything to do with the participants sort of in a sort of family capacity maybe. So when you've got a trial of children, the parents would count in this group as well, or guardians or carers. And personnel refers to the staff working on the trial. So for example, intervention facilitators, nurses, interviewers, researchers, research students, anybody who is involved in the trial and in the care of the participants that are in the trial. So question again, do the participants and personnel know or suspect which group they are in? Um, and could they use that knowledge to influence the participants' performance in the trial, so their outcome? Or could it influence performance unconsciously? So again, this comes back to this, is it deliberate or accidental? Um, you know, sometimes, um, you can't blind participants or personnel. So for example, um, I was referring to psychological interventions before, the same goes for surgery. There is, you know, some, some trials use uh, sham surgery where, where it just looks like you had surgery, but you didn't really. But I think that's quite involved and not that common. So in some trials, you can blind participants and personnel. But the importance of this domain depends on the outcome that you're looking at. So, for example, if it's, um, if it's a participant rated depression scale, for example, that is your main outcome and you, you have you know, either a psychological intervention or an antidepressant, then you must expect that maybe um, based on their own personal beliefs, people will rate their depression differently. You know, if, if you've got somebody who thinks, oh, these antidepressants don't do anything, um, then they might not answer the, the questions in the questionnaire in an unbiased way. Very closely re related to this is detection bias. So this is the blinding of outcome assessors. So these people can be the same as the study personnel or different. And again, the question is, do they know or can they suspect which group the participant is or was in? And if they do, could that knowledge, consciously or unconsciously, influence their assessment? So this is separate from blinding of participants and personnel, but it's particularly important when participants and personnel are not blinded. Um, so for example, if you have your psychological therapies and antidepressants trial and at the end of your trial you're doing a diagnostic interview to sort of establish whether or not these participants have depression. Um, if this interview is conducted by the same person who was delivering the psychological therapies all the way through or by the psychiatrist who was prescribing the antidepressants, then obviously they are unblinded to um, which group the participant that they're seeing at the end of the trial was in. However, if you have somebody else conduct that interview who wasn't part of the trial, then you have blinded your outcome assessor. And the idea there is that that's a less biased um, approach. The alternative would be that the, um, the person who was involved throughout the trial um, does the interviews, the diagnostic interviews, and then a video of those is watched by somebody else and they then make that final diagnostic decision. So there's ways and means around it. And again, the, important of, the importance of this domain also depends on the type of outcome. If the outcome of interest is death, all this blinding is a lot less important because um, there is a very few ways you could bias that kind of assessment.
attrition bias is the next um, domain. So this is about incomplete outcome data in the trial. So that, that refers to dropouts or loss to follow up. And the questions you need to ask yourself here is, A, is this documented? So is there full reporting of how many people were recruited to the trial, how many were randomized, how many had their baseline assessment and how many were assessed at each follow up point as you work through the trial? And is it balanced across the groups? And is it explained? Um, so, for example, in most trials, there is some kind of a dropout rate because people move away, people don't want to continue, people die, you know, things happen. But this needs to be documented and explained. And if there is any kind of indication that, for example, um, all the people in the um, psychological therapies group or lo loads of people in the psychological therapies group dropped out, but not so many um, in the antidepressants group, then there's obviously a bias there. And that's something to do then with the acceptability of the treatment. Um, and that's a difficult one to assess, but it's something that you need to pick up on when you're reading this kind of trial report. And again, obviously, the, the key question is, how does it impact the reliability of the results? So it's, um, it's important that you're not just sort of going by, oh, well, 80% of participants were followed up. So this is absolutely fine. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving away from those kind of arbitrary cut cutoffs. It's, it's more a judgment call for each trial and also the reporting of the trial. Speaking of reporting, um, this is reporting bias. And the question here is, are full results reported for all of the outcomes? And if not, how could that bias the conclusions of the paper? So sometimes you need to go back to the trial protocol for this, which is something that we discussed a couple of minutes ago, um, that RCTs do now need to be registered and those registrations are publicly available. So you can go back to the trial registration and you can see, okay, in, this, in the protocol they specified they were going to look at this list of outcomes. You go back to the paper and yeah, everything is reported. Obviously you start asking questions when things just sort of disappear or when lots and lots of positive results, positive in inverted commas here are reported in a lot of detail. And then maybe there's just a sentence that says something about um, a non-significant result, but without numbers being provided, which obviously doesn't help if we're wanting to carry out a meta-analysis where we would need the data. So again, the question is, why does it matter? And how would it bias the, the outcomes and the results of the paper? Now, I think those five domains are pretty comprehensive, but if there is anything um, that isn't covered in those domains, then there is this option of having the other bias category. So for example, you could talk about conflicts of interest here. Um, if you know all of the trial authors, for example, are very, very invested in the intervention, um, that might be considered a conflict of interest, or if they were all, yeah, if, 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 if there's something there that doesn't sit quite right, sometimes that is to do with funding, you know, who, who sponsored the trial, how involved were they in the conduct of the trial, and anything else really that isn't already covered by the other domains can be reported here. I think there's been a few questions just in terms of blinding and just to be clear that for some interventions, it is impossible to blind the participants or the treating clinician to the group allocation. They will know whether this is this person's in the intervention group or not. So things like surgery, things like uh, psychotherapy, it's impossible to, you know, to hide the fact that someone's in the intervention group, but you try and do it as much as possible. So if you've got a medication as your trial, you know, that's the intervention you're trying to trial, you can create a placebo. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the intention is to try and blind the participant and the physical treating clinician. Um, but if it's impossible, Jen mentioned that you can try then to blind the person that's assessing the outcome of the trial. 
I think that's that's really good to reinforce that point there. I've just come across a trial recently that was a three arm trial where it was placebo, um, an antidepressant and a hormone patch for for treating postnatal depression. And in that um, in that in that trial, they actually had two versions of placebo. So they had a placebo pill to mirror the antidepressant pill, and they also had a placebo patch. So even um, the people who were getting patches, so the the um, the they had two different versions of the placebo to make it as blind as possible. Obviously, you would still know whether you were in the patch group or the pill group, but there are always ways and means to blind as much as possible. Yeah, Alexandra is just pick, picking some of those up in, in the chat as well. Questions about what the perfect tool is. It doesn't exist. <laughs> and um, the risk of bias tool that I've talked about today is not suitable for cohort or observational studies. So there are other versions there for those. Um, so for cohort and observational studies, for example, there is um, the Robin's Eye, which is a Cochrane um, tool. And then there is also things like the Newcastle Ottawa scale. And it all becomes a bit messier, I think, because the, the report, like those studies are just, they're so much more varied than in a systematic review. And then there was a qu question about the Haddad score. So Alexander, I'm going to ask you to elaborate on, on the capital not recommended there. Um, why, why is the Haddad not generally considered a, a suitable tool? Oh, now I have to go back several years. Uh, so the <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the Jadat score um, or scale it was recommended at one time, uh, but from what I remember, uh, it was first quite simple. Mm -hmm. Second, um, it used a final score number, which is something that uh, we've kind of like moved. Uh, away from. Uh, and third, I think the different items refer to um, things that we would not consider in a risk of bias tool nowadays. Yeah, no, I th you, you sort of covered my my remem my memory of, of why Haddad has sort of been discounted now. I think for me, the biggest problem always was with this one summary score where you couldn't actually tell um, where the problems were if um, trial authors, for example, just reported that overall score for each study. Uh, if review, sorry, review authors just reported the overall score for each trial, it was basically impossible to know why they g gave that score. So I'm going to carry on with the last couple of slides, but do keep the questions coming. Like I said, we can wrap those up. Um, in, in a summary document um, of, that we will share with you after the session. So just one quick slide on some of the practicalities to do with risk of bias assessment. Um, so like I said at the very beginning, it can be carried out as part of your data extraction, but it is always a separate form um, because you are asking these very specific questions that just don't really sit with the sort of numerical or descriptive data that you're getting out of the paper. Usually it's conducted in the same way as data extraction. So it's carried out in duplicate or with one person extracting and another person checking. Um, because some of these, well, all of these questions really are, you have to make a certain judgment call and just having that double checked and sort of verified by a, a second person is it's just best practice for systematic reviewing to reduce your the risk of bias in your review processes. Often risk of bias assessment is made very, very hard by poor or incomplete reporting of trials. Things have got better more recently, I would say because there is more of a push to transparency. Online journals obviously help because people can, you know, put things in online appendices and supplementary files that maybe they previously had to leave out of printed journal articles. But still, I think this is my plea to any of you who are involved in trials. When you're reporting a trial, just think of the 
think of the systematic reviewer who one day in the future would like to include your trial in a meta-analysis or a, or a systematic review and just make it really easy for them. <laughs> just report everything, be crystal clear, have a good protocol, because otherwise you end up in that situation I described earlier where you have lots of unclear risk of bias ratings that are just not very helpful. Risk of bias assessment can be done in Covidence. I don't know of any other software tools that include risk of bias or that include other risk of bias tools. So Co Covidence being a Cochrane software, they have integrated functionality for the Cochrane risk of bias tools. And Revman, Cochrane's systematic review software, produces those traffic light figures um, to summarize risk of bias in the included study. So you might have come across these. I know other people, you know, make their own version in Excel, for example, um, so that you have red to indicate high risk of bias, yellow or orange for unclear and green for low risk of bias. Um, and that can sort of be a good at a glance kind of overview of the bias in the included trials. Then there is this thing called GRADE that some of you might have come across, and this is about risk of bias for each outcome. So rather than looking at individual studies, you're looking across studies for each outcome, and um, you're making a separate assessment as part of GRADE, um, which I'm not going to cover in this session now. Um, I've put the link to the great working group website on the slide there. So do go and check that out if, if you're interested. Grade assessments generate the summary of findings tables, which are now part of, of some systematic reviews and are certainly compulsory for Cochrane now. So I'm sure some of you will have come across it. And if you're interested to find out more, do have a look at their website. It's, it's very comprehensive. Can I just add, Jen, that in yeah. response to earlier questions about, you know, what to do about quality assessments, actually GRADE helps you do something about them. So across uh, all the studies for a particular outcome, it gives you an assessment of uh, how robust that evidence is and allows you to make a judgment about the quality of evidence and downgrade the overall assessment of quality of, of, of evidence depending on the grade uh, results. So it does take into account all those risks of risk of bias assessments you've done on the individual studies. Yeah. I'll stop there because it's complex how you do it, but um, <laughs> there's, you can read about it. Yeah, thanks Najma, that, that was really good context. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely second the complexity of grade that would fill, well, not just its own webinar, you could run a, run a separate course just on grade. So that would be beyond the scope of what we have time for today. But this is now the promised slide with all the links for further reading. So the first one there is a BMJ paper that's open access. Um, it's the risk of bias one development paper. And this includes the theoretical background as well as some practical tips. Um, which which I think is quite a quite a nice combination. So if, if they're the Practical tips are in a nice handy box. So if you want to have a look um, just at those, then do go ahead and focus on, on those hints and tips. But if you are interested in some of the theoretical background, then do use that um, paper to give you a flavor. And then there are some resources to do with risk of bias 2.0, which as I said, essentially assesses the same information. It's just, laid out and presented in a different way that is maybe less straightforward. Um, I'm not advocating one over the other. I am just saying that it's a different way of doing it that um, is, I think, from experience, rather more involved in, in some ways. So there is links to the Cochrane Methods um, group there. And then there's also a link to the to chapter eight of the current Cochrane Handbook, if you really want to know the ins and outs of it. The third bullet point down is a Cochrane training resource um, for, to a webinar about risk of bias 2.0. And then there's also a 
um, good introduction to critical appraisal on the CCMD YouTube channel. So in the same place where you find our videos, you will also find um, some other methodological videos that CCMD have shared there. I will leave you with this because this is also your homework, basically. We're not setting you a task today because I think I have thrown a lot of information um, at you today, quite some quite technical stuff. Do go away and do some further reading and we will then start the next session with a dedicated question and answer. Next time when we speak about meta-analysis, we will put some more things into context for you. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.